Hello YouTube, welcome back to the channel. So let's do this thing. AW Dynamite review for March the 1st, 2023, the first episode of March and the go home show for Revolution. There will be a Rampage episode on Friday, but obviously it'll be a pre-tape leading into the final little bits. But for the majority of it, you know, the live show is really the go home show and that's what we're going to pay attention to tonight. Right off the very top, I'll just say it. It wasn't a bad episode. It's one of those things where this AEW Dynamite episode, if I just looked at it in a vacuum and I saw it as a standalone episode, there was quite a bit that happened on it and quite a bit that moved and progressed some different little storylines. We, we criticize the fact that AEW doesn't seem to have enough storylines. In this case, I would say probably still there is a lack of storylines, but at least there are feuds. And there was progression to several of those feuds, which I'll talk about through the review. But at the same time, it felt like you shoehorned a lot of things in because it's almost like Tony Khan just realized, wait a minute, the calendar, when are we doing the pay-per-view? Oh, this Sunday. This Sunday? Oh my goodness. We're going to have to put everything in it. And they basically made up for it in promos. Endless promos, vignettes, pre-tapes, and even video packages. Everything was crammed into the show in order to try to fill in the gaps. And I'll make the analogy that it's like trying to land a plane. And the way I look at it, and this will be the way that I'll explain the review, is that I felt like they land the plane probably about as well as you could expect them to have landed the plane. Now the problem is, if I extend this analogy, my question is, given their navigation problems earlier on, did they land the plane in the correct place? They found an airport, they found a place to land it, but the question was, is this actually where you were supposed to land the thing, or did we just do this because we ran out of time and we were running low on fuel and we just needed to land somewhere? So we did land, we landed safely, but did we land where we were supposed to land? And that's kind of an open question that I have coming out of the show. So with that said, let's get into the review. Off the top, you start off with Orange Cassidy taking on Big Bill for the AEW All-Atlantic Championship. As generally is the case, the All-Atlantic Championship matches are fun because Orange Cassidy is good at what he does. This crowd was hot for it as well, so that's great. That really helped make the show a lot more lively. But what I really came down to is that Big Bill looked fantastic in this. But Big Bill being stuck with this whole firm thing, and I'll talk about the firm again a couple more times throughout this review, is that he looks fantastic, and he was able to showcase a lot of his power and a lot of the things that he can do, but then it's bogged down early. Even at the beginning of this match, we're already bogged down with comedy right at the first start with Orange Cassidy, which isn't necessarily a problem because it can be fun. It adds a little variety to the show. I actually like Orange Cassidy for what he brings to the table because he can wrestle. He does have that capability. He can shift to that gear, and when allowed to, he can put on a decent match. And in the end, the match became okay, but the problem was that the booking on this was really bad for me. I'll go into a couple of specific things that troubled me about it, but it kind of wrecked what otherwise could have been a really good match. But early on, it's comedy, like I mentioned, and there was a really strong choke slam spot where Big Bill was able to slam him through a table. And then we basically went to commercial break and then we had the little picture in picture thing and you could watch what was going on. And basically what Big Bill was doing is he was wasting time when, you know, common sense would tell you, you just choke slam the guy through a table and he's basically dead to rights. Throw him the ring, pin him, you're the All-Atlantic champion, let's move on. I'm going to talk about factions again a little bit, but this tends to be a reoccurring theme with a lot of these factions in that, you know, they'll talk a big game, they'll do a lot of things, but at the end of the day, the accomplishments don't really seem to rack up for a lot of these factions all throughout AEW. And that's been a problem for a lot of its history. But as I made the note here, instead of pinning him, he throws him around during the break until Danhausen shows up. And Danhausen will also play into the rest of this uh, show as well, because he'll come up again in a different match. Another spot here that I liked, but also didn't like, is that Big Bill gets him into a full Nelson. So he's got him in, given the size of Big Bill being seven feet tall and like jacked, he basically looks like this could be a finisher. Like, he hasn't used this as a finisher, as to my knowledge, but the way he has it, it looks like, with his size, it looks like it could be a finisher. It looks like Orange Cassidy is about to, you know, basically pass out from this, but instead it just kind of continues, and then he ends up kind of making a mistake and releasing it, and then the match continues. This is the second time where Big Bill probably should have just won the match and been done with it, and yet the match continues, and that's kind of my issue with this thing. It, go, it continues to go back and forth, Big Bill showing off great power, Orange Cassidy kind of evading him and basically continuing back and forth. And in the end, it ends up being three orange punches, including a third one from the top rope. So I'll give him credit. As far as an ending is concerned, three orange punches, including one from the top rope, that's probably what would have been required for Orange Cassidy to believably win this match and retain his title. But at the same time, like the way you book this match, don't put Big Bill in this match if you're not going to have him I wouldn't have put him in this match. If you're going to do something like this, I would have had it be on a pay-per-view. And honestly, I probably would have had Big Bill win the thing. Especially given the spots that you gave him in this match. What more could he have done without actually winning the title? And how stupid does he look not being able to successfully take it home when in reality he dominated the majority of this match? The Orange Cassidy, you know, comeback story is great and all, but at the same time, it's like this might have been the time and the opportunity to put it on somebody else. 
and let the firm at least have a champion in their stable and give them a little bit more strength. I'll talk about the stables again in a little bit. Regardless, my takeaway from this was bad booking, but a creative ending. So I'll give them credit for that. But it, And the crowd in the end enjoyed it, but it was bad booking from my perspective even putting him in that play in that situation in the first place. Next up here is the first of probably 27 million promos on the show. And it's from John Moxley, presumably recorded in the immediate aftermath of his match with Evil Uno last week. And at this point he's both caked and pouring blood. And it, it's a great visual and it adds to the intensity of John Moxley's promo. So he talks about the uh, Texas death match and how he's an animal and how, you know, there can only be one in this ecosystem. And in all honesty, I think John Moxley was, it was at his best here trying to convey the story that he, from his perspective, he wanted to end it. And this was going to be his avenue to do so. And he basically was emphasizing his toughness and the fact that he's like literally bleeding this the way somebody would sweat and you've got blood pouring all over the stairs that he's uh, basically sitting on. It, it really added a great visual element. I will say it was effective. That's kind of the note that I made is that it was effective. I thought it was really good in terms of trying to push that match and, you know, give it. Like I said, these promos, for the most part, actually did a good job trying to sell this pay-per-view. My point is, why weren't we doing stuff like this before leading us into it instead of doing our homework at the last possible second and trying to make up for lost time. So next up here are two things that are kind of tied together. And again, they'll play into the faction thing. So the elite versus the house of black is made official for the trios championships. And then immediately after we move to the music playing and the elite is about to come out. They're actually out in the ramp and they're about to make their entrance and everything and do their usual shtick. But then the lights go out. And then all of a sudden you see the house of black behind them, the silhouette of them behind them. And then the lights go out a second time. And then you hear a scuffle, you hear, you know, fighting. And then the house of black is there holding the titles while the elite are on the ground, you know, writhing in agony. So at this point they're posing with the titles. The house of black is showing this. I've got a couple points about this that I'm going to come back to later because they do have a promo in the show because of course they do. So we'll come back to that after the fact. Almost immediately next, we get into face of the revolution ladder match with Samoa Joe on commentary. Now this was a great match. And like I said, the crowd was hot for this. So I'm not really going to go into a bunch of the different spots into it because there were tons. I will say if you want to see a standalone match, this was a crazy match. As is AEW's way that when different performers get this opportunity, they will pull out all the stops. Some of them are a little bit dangerous, but I'll get into it as I go through it. Takeshka had an impressive sequence against Powerhouse Hobbs, who was getting kind of the hometown cheer, that which is great. And then there was a dangerous suplex sequence there on the ladders from Action Andretti versus Sammy Guevara, where I honestly thought the two guys were going to hurt themselves. And they very, very closely, if they didn't at least ding themselves up, they probably got very close and got lucky that they probably didn't hurt themselves more. And the next point I made was that it seems silly to kill yourself to earn a title shot on TV. And that was kind of my issue with this whole thing. The match itself from a spot sequence, if you like your action, this was really good. But it's one of the bad habits that AEW and Tony Khan's booking has where they have this match where these guys are going to murder themselves to get this title shot at the TNT champion, whomever that may be after the pay-per-view, because they did emphasize that with Samoa Joe and Wardlow having the match at the pay-per-view, that whoever the winner is and is the champion coming out of it will be facing that person in the following week's Dynamite. So you've already basically booked your next uh, TNT challenger coming off of this ladder match. But these guys are killing themselves not to get a match on the pay-per-view. They're killing themselves to get a match on TV. It is a title match, but it is a match on TV. It, it seems a little bit silly, but anyway, I'm just going to leave it at that. So Garcia comes out from the JAS to interfere, helping Sammy take out Andretti. So we got the Sammy Guevara jumping off something really high spot, in this case, a really tall ladder, onto a setup with Action Andretti on top of a ladder that was a very dangerous spot, but a great, a great visual spot. But it goes back to kind of two things. So on the one hand, it kind of continues the little feud that they had with Action Andretti. So it makes sense from a storyline perspective. But at the same time, aren't you trying to win this ladder match to get this title shot? And then almost immediately after you do that and hurt yourself at the same time that you're hurting Action Andretti. So you take Action Andretti out of the equation, but then your Tim, you being Sammy Guevara is also injured. And then Garcia has to like drag you into the ring and try to set you up to try to climb the ladder. It didn't seem like the wisest strategy is basically what I'm getting at as far as that's concerned. Now in the end, the closing sequence is the powerhouse Hobbs nearly destroys the ladder. And it was hilarious because uh, AEW is smart about this where they've got so many referees out there and the referees do help stabilize these ladders. But the thing is, they're not subtle about it at all. In this case, Powerhouse Hobbs nearly destroyed this ladder. The ladder is twisted. <laughs> I'm surprised it can even support his weight. And basically, one of the referees, one of the poor referees has to be there and completely stabilize this ladder so, the, so this gigantic man can climb it. And he has to climb it almost to the tippy top to get this gigantic, you know, Sonic the Hedgehog ring. Uh, because that's how you win this uh, face of the revolution. And I think he was trying to figure out how to take it off of the thing. Anyway, Powerhouse Ops wins, which is great because coming out of it, we're going to have a good old fashioned Hoss fight. 
So regardless, if it's Samoa Joe or Wardlow, we're going to have them against Powerhouse Hobbs. So Haas fight. I'm, in, I'm into it. I'm a big fan. So he got a great pop out of it. And in the end, honestly, out of the competitors, fun match, but probably the correct winner. And there was a luchador guy whose name escaped me. I want to say Commodore or something like that. I apologize. I, I didn't note the name. But he had a couple of crazy spots, including one where he walked the tightrope of one of the ropes and then literally jumped onto another rope and then dove out and basically did a moonsault on everybody, which is an amazing spot. I would recommend if you just want to see a match isolated in and of itself, this was a fun match and a great fun TV match, I'll say. So the next match here is actually in the, in the category of, yes, it's a continuation. Technically, we did give it a bit of an episodic slant to this. And it was a follow-up to last week. But at the same time, really, on the go-home show, we had time for this. Chris Jericho taking on Peter Avalon. Yes, Peter Avalon. And the reason for this is because Peter Avalon was actually trying to go out and take the open challenge last week that Ricky Starks was offering, which resulted in Chris Jericho coming out, giving him the Judas effect to take him out. And then we led into the promo and the sequence where he ended up accepting the challenge and taking the match. Fine. I, I, I'm glad that Peter Avalon actually cared enough to actually follow up and challenge Chris Jericho to try to get his revenge for basically losing out an opportunity to go on the pay-per-view. Good. I'm glad somebody wants to be on this pay-per-view and actually is willing to fight for it. So, so from that perspective, I'm happy. But at the same time, it's Peter Avalon. Uh, now, I will say this. AEW did give him a lot. They gave Peter Avalon probably the most offense that I have seen him have probably in his entire run in AEW. He actually dominated the majority of this match, and Chris Jericho did an amazing job selling it. But in the end, he, he, you know, Peter Avalon got almost everything in this match, and then Chris Jericho hits him with one code breaker and wins the match. And we're done with that. Now, post-match, that's where he starts attacking him with the bat, which leads to the Ricky Stark save. The reluctant save, which smart by him, he was at least looking over his shoulder to see if a JAS member would come up and try to attack him. He goes in to try to save Peter Avalon and help him out, but that's where Jericho grabs a microphone, yells at him, and in the end, the JAS folks were actually in the crowd and they went and attacked Ricky Starks, they beat him down, and the JAS is standing tall coming off of this. It is going to lead to the match of the pay-per-view, which is Chris Jericho versus Ricky Starks, but the JAS is banned from ringside from the match. So again, we did get a continuation and we did get a go-home angle on this, but at the same time, we came about it in a very silly and strange way. But there was continuity, so I guess bonus points for that, so I'll give it to you. Next up, Hangman promo, another pre-tape where he tried to give his angle of it. There was less intensity to it. He did try to give it a little bit of intensity to it, but literally John Moxley was bleeding buckets of blood. It's very difficult to try to contrast the two and feel that it's an equivalent level of intensity for this Texas death match. But nonetheless, they had a promo from Hangman's side of things to try to give his element, which is fine. Now, this is where we start getting into a bit of a problem. So I just said that we had a Hangman promo, a pre-tape promo. Now, remember, technically, Chris Jericho was on the microphone before the beatdown. I'm not going to count that as a promo, but I just want to point that out. You could make the argument that now the Hangman promo is the second promo in a row. Now I'm going to follow it up. How about an in-ring promo with Christian Cage, where Renee Paquette is doing yeoman's work here because she's going to interview a bunch of people on the show. So he comes out and he challenges Jungle Boy to a fight and actually has a great promo. I'll give it Christian Cage actually put together a great promo in it, setting it up. But I'm going to point something out here. If we're really thinking about this, he's explaining his rationale and he's putting in lots of intensity into it, which I do like. And I think the crowd actually got to him a little bit. He kind of stuttered over a couple of his words, but for the most part, I think it was a really good promo. But then technically, immediately, now remember, he's in the ring giving this promo live. But immediately, we go to darkness. No, it's not the House of Black this time. We go to darkness and it is a video prepackaged promo of Jungle Boy digging a grave. They put together a whole video package, you know, summarizing the feud and everything up until that point, which is good. And then it shows that he, he is digging the grave of Christian Cage. Very dramatic. Question, how did you already have that prepared, Jungle Boy? You didn't even know what Christian Cage was going to say. You didn't even know if Christian Cage was going to have a promo, but you happen to have a video package ready to go of you digging a grave. How wonderfully convenient. So let that be noted as promo number two. And you could argue promo number three if we count the prepackage, and we could count it as promo number four if we count the Hangman promo as well that way. But I'm going to say two for now because I'm going to get to the next one. Then we get to a Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter backstage promo. That is at the minimum three promos in a row. I'm going to emphasize again, if I count the Jungle Boy response, that's four. And if I count Chris Jericho on the microphone giving a promo before a beatdown, that's five. Five promos in a row on this show. A little bit of overkill, Tony Khan. Just a little bit of overkill, I'm just going to say. 
But it was fine because it set up that Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter were noting that if there was interference uh, in the upcoming match with Tony Storm and Riho, that they would be around. Because of course they are. I'll get to that when we get to that match. Next up, a wrestling match. How novel. Matt Hardy taking on Hook for the FTW Championship. But it's also for like a meaningless title. The FTW Championship, to be clear, is not a sanctioned title. And yet, here we are. Again, this was a continuation of a storyline because Matt Hardy has been having his issue with the firm and the fact that he's stuck there under contract with them and kind of has to do their bidding, but he's kind of undermining them from the inside. So this is a continuation of a storyline. It's a continuation of a storyline I don't really care about, but it is a continuation of a storyline because the firm, apparently, this is what they do. They get into meaningless feuds and storylines that are there, and in this case, we have some continuity, but they don't matter. And the stipulation here is that if he cannot beat Hook for the FTW Championship, the stipulation, I believe, was that Stokely Hathaway would be stuck in a match with Hook where the firm couldn't help him. So that was, those are the stakes. And, you know, Matt Hardy set it up beautifully to the point that he even got Ethan Page to kind of get in on it and they all like being enthusiastic about it. Anyway, the match was decent for what it was. Matt Hardy got in a fair bit of offense against Hook because Hook is still very young in his career. So for the most part, he'd been dominating most of his opposition. Matt Hardy's a veteran, so he was able to use a lot of his veteran savvy, put together plenty of offense. But in the end, it was back and forth. But then as soon as Hook was able to hit the uh, connect with the red rum and put it on Matt Hardy, it was an immediate super quick tap. And all of a sudden, Stokely Hathaway is freaking out. And after Stokely Hathaway had done everything in his power to help cheat, they even used a little cast as a weapon. And in the end, Stokely Hathaway now is going to have to face Hook without the help of the firm. And then you show a clip, a little uh, video quickly on the side of Matt Hardy kind of smiling because that was kind of his plan all along. Again, there is some continuity. Good. There was a story there. Good. Do I really care about this particular stake and Stokely Hathaway getting his comeuppance? Not really. Why would I? He is the leader of a fairly incompetent faction. Why do I care that he's going to get his comeuppance? Fine. Beat him up. What, what difference does it make? But like, it's fine. But again, this is a go-home show for your pay-per-view. Did this... Pre you couldn't have done this on Rampage? The pre-tape show? You could have probably have done this on Rampage and it would have been perfectly fine. I I'm just pointing that out. But anyway, fine. The match was decent enough for what it was. Next up, a House of Black promo. Because of course it is. Another promo. Then ho them holding the trio's titles. A follow-up to the previous segment where they were out there holding the titles and they took them away. And they basically said they would leave them there because they belonged to the Elite. And that's your setup into the match for them at Revolution, which is fine. And I'm looking forward to the match. I think the match is going to be fine. But here's my concern. This build was almost nothing. We had almost nothing leading into They kind of just alluded to this. But then this was really the first kind of time they touched or did anything directly to each other. And they were, the, that's great, but the pay-per-view is this week. It's literally on Sunday. So this was the first opportunity to actually, literally the match was announced on this show. And that's immediately a title match for trios. Guys, I'm just going to say it. The House of Black should win this. I don't think they will, but they should. <laughs> like at this point, the House of Black is another one of these factions who make a lot of noise, but they don't accomplish anything. These guys are way too talented. I want to see more House of Black. I would love nothing more than for the House of Black to win this title and then immediately start entering into some fun trios feuds. Because Buddy Matthews, Malachi Black, and Brody King are fantastic. And they would be great trios champions, but the Elite just got their trios championship back not that long ago. So would they actually take it off the Elite? I have questions. I would at this point because the House of Black needs this way more than the Elite needs this. But that's just kind of my opinion on that. That's me throwing in my two cents. But it would be awkward at the same time. They need it. I think it makes sense from their perspective for the House of Black to have some credibility and actually have championships to for all this faction warfare they've been doing this whole time. I think it would be good for them to actually have that and demonstrate that we're actually putting something behind them and then, it, you know, make sure you put something behind them. Treat them as serious champions if you do it. But at the same time, then what do you do with the Elite? I guess you could find some things for them to do, but it's, you're going to need some trios teams lined up to face them if you decide to go that route. I just feel like I'll do maybe a separate video talking about predictions. I just feel like the Elite will probably take that one because this is being thrown together last minute. All right, next up, we have the Token Ladies match. We have Tony Storm taking on Riho. My question and my next point here was, at what point would an opponent just bring back up at the start? You know that Tony Storm is going to eventually get interference from Soraya. Tony Storm is coming out there with Soraya. Therefore, you're at a two to one disadvantage automatically. If you're Riho, not having backup means you're an idiot. Could you not have asked Hikaru Shida, your fellow, ja your fellow Japanese lady, to come out and help you, potentially, overcome any interference.
Now, in the end, like I said, I'll, I'll get to the segment here in the match, but I'm just pointing out that you're basically making people really stupid. And there, there is some upside to this, though. I will say, I will make the note as well that there was some upside to it. And I, literally next, my next point here is I said, the good, question mark, a decent amount of TV matches with Tony Storm. So I approve of that. And I am enjoying heel Tony Storm. I think she's kind of working her way into that character. I think she's been getting better at it. And I like the fact that she... Given that she's probably that she's by far the healthier of the two, even though Soraya's had a couple of matches here and there, it is better for her matches to be spaced out. Tony Storm can do the majority of the matches, and the good news for her is that she's getting matches on TV. I like that. The problem is it tends to be a little bit repetitive, not because of opponents, because she is getting different opponents, and that part I like. But the problem is this is the only match you're being you're getting every week. Good thing that Tony Storm is getting matches. I like that. But at the same time, it's literally Tony Storm versus someone who's an AEW quote-unquote original, and then it leads to some form of interference, and then Jamie Hayter and Britt Baker come out. We literally have done this for many, many consecutive weeks. It's a bit formulaic. You know, mix it up in some way. Like, think about this a little. It would have made sense for Hikaru Shida to help out Riho. Or someone else from the, from the Japanese portion of the roster. One of the ladies could have come out to help her provide some backup. I'm just throwing it out there. So anyway, Soraya, not shockingly, interferes. Jamie Hayter and Britt Baker come out to kind of even the score a little bit and keep them honest. Britt Baker ends up helping Riho win, which finally leads to something progressing in this because things break down. As Tony Storm and Britt Baker are fighting on the outside, Jamie Hayter and Soraya start fighting in the ring, and then eventually they're joined by Ruby Soho, who ends up fighting them both because that's your three-way match leading a revolution. So this is a bit of a fight, pull apart kind of thing, and that's how we finish this section of it in the go-home show. I'm fine with the end result. Again, we got where we needed to get to, but we literally had to shoehorn it into one show because week after week after week, it was Tony Storm or Soraya against one opponent. They interfere, win the match by cheating, and then attack their opponent. And you did this a bunch of times. And then Jamie Hayter and Britt Baker in some combination, or both of them most of the time, come out to even the score. But you did this so many weeks in a row that it kind of loses its effect. At a certain point, it's like, well, bring your own back up before it even gets to that, and then you wouldn't have this problem. A little bit of common sense goes a long way, but we're a little lazy on the storyline. The, the part I'm happy about is at least there was progression, and we did get eventually to where we needed to get to, where we got all three of them in the ring at the same time, fighting each other, being pulled apart before the pay-per-view. But again, this is literally on the go-home show before the pay-per-view. You could have even done a contract signing if you wanted to go that route in order to at least establish this dynamic in some way. All right, next up, Keith Lee and Dustin Rhodes promo. Hey, a promo. That's a, That hasn't happened in like five minutes. Uh, they throw out a challenge against the Mogul Affiliates for Rampage. So fair enough. You you could have had this match on Dynamite and you could have done the Peter Avalon, Chris Jericho thing on Rampage. Just throwing it out there. Now you could argue that's not necessarily a Dynamite quality match, but I will remind you also that I just said Jericho and Peter Avalon. What difference does it make? One or the other. Anyway, next up, Revolution Tag Team Battle Royale. Now, lots of action in this one. I didn't like how this was played out. Now, I did like the fact that several of the tag teams did eventually kind of split up into some of their existing feuds. Uh, the Lucha Brothers were actually attacked by Josh Woods, Tony Nese, and Ari Davari on the outside, kind of led to their elimination. Several eliminations happened in quick succession, but... I won't go through the blow by blow. Different teams had different moments, which is fine. You had teams come out. You had the Kingdom come out. You had the Butcher and the Blade come out. And towards the tail end, you ended up with the Butcher and the Blade right there at the end. But here's what I didn't like. And I'm being completely honest about this. I did not like that you, in the end, you had Danhausen and Orange Cassidy in this. And I, I missed uh, the note, unfortunately. One of the backstage promos, another backstage promo that I missed here somehow in the million and 18 promos was that the best friends were injured and incapacitated. But Danhausen volunteered himself and Orange Cassidy after the match that he had had with Big Bill, where he's injured and like his ribs are taped up, to participate in this, representing the best friends. So Danhausen argues for this and is able to get Orange Cassidy, who says whatever, to agree to this. And in the end, a broken, injured Orange Cassidy and Danhausen eliminate the Busher and the Blade, a legitimate tag team, who probably could have fit into this match perfectly fine, they eliminate them in order to take up the final spot. So you got Danhausen and Orange Cassidy being inserted into this match with Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal, the Guns, and the Acclaimed in your four-way for the Tag Team Championships at Revolution. Why? If this is what you're going to end up with, and this is the fourth team you have, why do you even bother having a fourth team? 
it, it, it's a way to get Orange Cassidy on the show and Danhausen on the show. I get it. And people did like Danhausen. Like they appreciated him in the, in the in the arena. But at the same time, come on, guys. This is uh, this is lazy stuff. I would much much rather have seen Butcher and the Blade in this match and at least have a moment on the pay per view because they're at least a legitimate tag team. You got a half broken guy and Danhausen who half the time is comedy and Orange Cassidy who can also be comedy being your fourth tag team, fitting into the match. Like come on. Anyway, so the end result of all this is that. Jay Lethal and uh, Jeff Jarrett and the Guns end up attacking Dan Housen and Orange Cassidy, of course, and the Acclaim come in to make the save. So it establishes our four-way match for Revolution. Fair enough. Next up here, you're not going to believe this, but a video promo hyping up the MJF Danielson match, which was actually extremely well done. I did like that. It had a lot. Of, it had some training montages in there, a lot of clips, uh, basically recapping the feud up until this point, which is good. It actually sets up things very nicely. It also showed MJF in training, you know, working his butt off to, to work towards a 60-minute match, doing all those things. You had Brian Danielson out there doing hikes, climbing mountains, meditating, focusing on trying to get himself in the right frame of mind and, you know, physically in order to do the 60-minute Iron Man match that they're going to hype up for the pay-per-view. Very good. So our closing thing ends up being a promo in the ring. So we just had the video promo, but now we get a promo. So Renee Paquette is back out there to interview Brian Danielson. And we start with Brian Danielson talking. We get MJF out there with a microphone and everything. And we get Brian Danielson cutting him off immediately. And then running down all the things that he had said, all the things that he had done, and basically saying what you deserve, you know, talking about all those things that he claimed to deserve, but the thing that he deserved was his fiance leaving him, you know, kind of his, re his return shot back. But I will remind you that last week, MJF was talking to his kids, quote unquote, and Brian Danielson was in the ring powerless to stop him from being able to uh, say these horrible things. And he just let him do it until the very end when they finally started fighting a little bit. But in this case, Brian Danielson ran him down verbally, got in the last word. He actually got to say everything. And in the end, he swore at him. He used the swears. It was fine. Like, uh, Brian Danielson knows how to bring the intensity, and it was a good closing promo to end what was, to, what was a good final day of the build for the pay-per-view. But... And with that, that's how we went off the air. But this last entire explanation, this last little bit, is a microcosm of my issue with this go-home show. As I said, as a standalone show, I liked it. As a standalone show, there was a lot of things that I did enjoy. Some things made me shake my head, but for the most part, I thought it was decent. As a go-home show, it didn't get the job done for me. Because you felt that they were doing everything in their power to fill in all those gaps and all the things they had missed all those weeks leading up to it. This final sequence was beautiful. We got this amazing video promo package that actually did a great job encapsulating the Brian Danielson MJF feud. And then we got a strong final promo from Brian Danielson to try to sell it and hammer home the point. But we were meandering for weeks leading up to it. We were doing all these little things, but we were never quite reaching the level we needed to. So as I said in my beginning analogy, we did land the plane. My question is, did we land it in the right airport? Are we in the right city? Are we in the right state? How close are we to where we probably should have been had everything been allowed to breathe and moot progress? In the end, we got Powerhouse Hobbs winning the Face of the Revolution match. That's good. The crowd liked it. And it's going to lead to a match, a beautiful Haas fight, next week. But not on the pay-per-view. So Hobbs is not going to be on the pay-per-view, which is a shame, given that I would like to see a little bit more for him. But that's fine. But at the same time, so we know what that match is going to be. And it's going to be against either Wardlow or Samoa Joe. Either way, I think it'll be fun. The point, though, is that we, for every moment like that, we had moments like the build to the three-way uh, match for the AEW Women's Championship, where things just kind of kept repeating week after week after week before we finally got that extra step. We finally got that escalation point right here at the very end. The four-way for the tag team champion was finalized right at the very end, and the last team he put in there was basically a comedy tag team. What's the point of having them in that slot? There were other options if you wanted to go there just to give somebody else an opportunity. I understand putting Orange Cassidy on the show. I understand that Danhausen is a popular character and people like him, but this was not the slot for them because they're not really going to be part of the result of this match. Well, maybe they will be part of the result, but they're not going to be winning this match. The The fight that people want to see is the Acclaim versus the Guns. That's the feud. And then Jeff Jarrett and Jay Lethal are kind of there as well. They're almost kind of the comedy side of it from that perspective that they're, you know, eventually these teams are going to turn on each other. You know, the little uh, handshake agreement that the Guns and Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett have will break down during the match. That was going to be one of the dynamics. But then you got, now you're going to have Dan Housen and Orange Cassidy there for reasons. And also, this episode emphasized 
the futility of factions right now in AEW. The JAS is reduced to being bit players in the face of the revolution match, worrying about their feud with Action Andretti, attacking Ricky Starks so that Chris Jericho can get one up on him after beating the vaunted Peter Avalon. That's the JAS. The House of Black didn't even have a match until this episode where they were announced that they were going to be facing up for the, the elite for the trios championship. But up until this point, there wasn't even one single war of words between the two. Literally, we're jumping from the House of Black alluding to it to them attacking the elite on this episode after the announcement of the match, doing a closing promo, which is fine, in this traditional style, which is great. I think the match will be good, but we, we skipped like 12 steps in order to get there. And this theme kept occurring over and over again. The Christian Cage Jungle Boy thing. You know, we, we suddenly got this sudden escalation. We went from basically barely having them touch to having them attack each other the previous week to one solid promo followed by a video package that had to be prepared in advance that just so happened to fit this promo. I was like, guys, guys, come on. It was, like I said, it was a good finish, but how we got there was very janky. That's why I say we landed the plane, but I don't think we landed in the right airport. Uh, but at least the plane landed safely. Like, it didn't crash land. So that that's a good thing, I suppose. And finally, the bottom line was there was progression to several feuds, which I appreciated and enjoyed. But several of them felt clunky. In, in fact, I would argue, probably of the way this show was built, probably the best feud that actually had the most uh, buildup and steps that were involved in it is John Moxley and Hangman Page. That one, at least has a little bit of backstory. You had the concussion, followed by the second match, followed by the third match, and then this presumably is going to be our blow-off match for the Texas Death Match. So you had escalated the intensity into it. That were, You had some matches that were already very physical. So you did have a progression. This is technically the fourth match in their series, and it's the stipulation match, which actually makes sense. That's probably the only match that was fleshed out the way that you would normally expect a match like this to be fleshed out. Which is good. From that perspective of that match, I think it's going to be solid. And the Brian Danielson MJF one at least had some lead way as Danielson jumped through the hoops leading up to him getting the match. But at the same time, it's like, even that one felt a little bit rushed there at the end, trying to make up for lost time. The last couple of weeks was basically them trying to push as much uh, narrative thread and emotion into it as possible to try to ratchet up the emotional investment of people right at the very end, just on the cusp of the pay-per-view. It was doing homework at the last possible minute for Tony Khan. And at this point, I don't know if he's capable of really understanding that and adjusting because you can't be doing that all the time. At this stage in the game, you really can't, you really have to figure out the pacing on this. The result, I think, is going to be fine. I think the pay-per-view is, as often the case with AEW, I think it's going to be solid, but it wasn't because the build did it any favors. It got, it's going to get there despite this build. And I'm hoping for some good matches on the pay-per-view, which I think will help make up for a lot of this. And I would love to see some better pacing for the next for the next big show. And I just don't know about that. And at the same time, uh, you know, one name I didn't call out at all because I don't think she's on the pay-per-view as far as I know. Uh, nothing for Jade Cargill. Just once again, kind of um, TBS champion, kind of forgotten. Off by the wayside. Hey, uh, we'll figure it out later. Which is a bit of a shame. You know, uh, we'll have to see how that turns out. But some of these other feuds kind of keep rolling along. And um, like I said, there is some progression, so... I suppose that's better than nothing. Well, that's basically all we can ask for at this point. At least there was some progression to some of these items. Now, uh, as far as the show itself, like I said, I'm going to treat it, I'm going to grade it based on a go-home show. If I'm grading it based on a standalone Dynamite, I'd be inclined to give it a C+, plus, maybe even a B-, minus, because it was a solid standalone show. But as a go-home show, I'm a lot closer to D-. minus. Like, it was close to a fail, because you had to push so many promos down everybody's throat in order to make up for lost time there. And that is a mistake that didn't have to happen. You had plenty of time to set this up and pace some of these things out a little bit better. So I'm giving a passing grade, but only by the narrowest of margins. We'll see what it looks like from as far as the pay-per-view is concerned. Uh, hopefully, we'll hope for the best. We'll cross our fingers, and we'll see what comes out of it. Anyway, that's it for my review of AEW Dynamite, March the 1st, 2023. I'd be curious to hear what you think about it in the comments section if, you feel, if you're so inclined. Otherwise, more videos coming up on the channel. Hopefully we'll do some more reviews and maybe some standalone videos. Like if you like the video, subscribe to the channel. It would be appreciated. Appreciate the support. Thanks very much. And we'll catch you in the next one.